Can we start? Yes. All right, so good morning and welcome to today's session. Um, my name is Leonie Hoxha. I'm a senior network consultant working for Cisco Systems for about seven years now. Um, today's se uh, session will be about segment routing. Now, I believe that some of you, if not most of you, uh, already have segment routing implemented in your networks. If not, then that's a good session for you, maybe, uh, to look at the benefits of it and how you can implement it in your networks. Um, so if you think about it, segment routing is not really something new, but um, technically it runs on top of MPLS, okay? And, but before we go there, let's see the agenda. Um, first, we'll look at the challenges that we are facing today with the current MPLS networks, right? Um, then we will move on with the segment routing uh, overview and the building blocks, so we will see exactly what are the components that make up segment routing. Um, in this case, that's the prefix seed and adjacency seed. There is more than that, but these are just the basic blocks. Um, and then we will move on with the TI-LFA or topology independent LFA. So TI-LFA is a protection mechanism, meaning that in case of a link failure or a node failure, we will see how it can um, overcome that problem and how you can reroute the traffic uh, without any, any problem. And then we will look at segment routing, traffic engineering, specifically um, together with the PC controller. And then last but not least, we'll check at some of the use cases. We'll see exactly how does segment routing fit today's world and how you can uh, leverage it. Specifically, we will look at uh, Flex Algo as the one over segment routing uh, disjointness paths with SRPCE, as well as inter-AS communication. So if you have two different BGP ASs and you would like to talk, you have services running from one AS to another AS, you will see how we can do that with the BGP peering seat. So um, we said we'll look at the challenges today, right? So imagine, if you look at the picture now, imagine you have um, a core network that runs MPLS as an underlay and layer three VPNs, so MPBGP as an overlay, right? And then on the left side, you have a Metro Ethernet network that uses Ethernet as an underlay and layer two VPNs, VPLS or pseudo-wise whatever, um, as an overlay. And then on the right hand side, you have a data center, which is actually where you offer the services for your customers. Um, where you use IP as an underlay and VXLAN as an overlay. So what that means, so you, you're splitting your network basically in three different parts or three different domains. Um, and obviously, it seems that also you might have different people taking care of different parts of the network, which is okay. However, this is also a challenge because um, the end user, which is on the left-hand side, uh, needs a service from your data center, right? Now, the packet will move from one domain to another, to another, and to another one, which means there will be always some sort of encapsulation, decapsulation, encapsulation, decapsulation, right? And uh, between the domains, you will have some sort of stitching, right? Because you need to make uh, layer two VPN talk to layer three VPN, and then talk to VX line, and vice versa, right? So it's quite complex. Uh, if you think of end-to-end uh, -end, uh, service provisioning. Um, and at the end of the day, this is all manual process today, at least. Um, with segment routing, what we think is, is a sort of a unified fabric for all the service creation. Now, what that means is, if you look back at the picture before, we said we have the metro, the core, and the data center. Um, we still have the same, but instead of using all these three different underlay protocols, you can use only one, which is segment routing. Um, now, if you run segment routing all the way from the axis to your aggregation to the core and to the data center, uh, you can think about it that it's just one protocol that you need to manage in cases you have any issues, if you want to troubleshoot the network, then you don't need to know all the different underlay protocols but if you know segment routing, that's the best way to do it. Now, that's not the only reason, of course. Uh, on top of segment routing, you can run now, instead of those different overlays, 
you can run eVPN as an example, right? You can have layer two VPNs, layer three VPNs on top of that running. Um, now, what do we eliminate with segment routing comparing to what we do today? So on the left-hand side, you have unified MPLS. Uh, with unified MPLS, you have two parts, right? You have the transport and you have the services part, meaning you run different protocols. In the transport, of course, you will always use IP for the connectivity, which is the same case with SR. Uh, you will use an, one of the IGPs, either um, OSPF or ISIS. MPLS LDP to distribute the labels. And then on top, you might use also RSVPTE if you do some sort of traffic engineering, bandwidth reservation, or fast reroute. And in some cases, also BGPLU. Now, BGPLU is basically RFC 3107, which you will usually use with uh, inter AS options, right? Um, that, that's the transport part. Now, the services part, you usually use BGP, of course. And at some points, also target LDP session in case you have some sort of, um, let's say, pseudo wire, so point to point. Uh, uh, layer 2 VPN uh, connections. Now, with segment routing on the right side, uh, you eliminate MPLS LDP, you eliminate RSVPT, you eliminate BGP LU. So basically what you have is only IP for the connectivity itself. You have one IGP, either ISIS or OSPF, and slash SR. What does that mean? Now that means that segment routing is not an additional protocol but it is just one of the IGPs with additional headers, right? Now, in case of um, ISIS, that would be some additional TLVs, and uh, in case of OSPF, that's um, additional LSA types. So imagine when the uh, OSPF or ISIS comes up, you are forming those neighborships, right? So point-to-point -point neighborship between routers. And you're exchanging the prefixes now, meaning you're exchanging the link state database between the devices, right? Now, with that link state database, um, segment routing labels are also exchanged on top, right? So now you don't need to activate LDP as an additional protocol to distribute the labels, but the IGP itself will do the same, right? And then on top, of course, um, for the services parts, Again, you eliminate LDP or RSVP, uh, but you can use uh, MPBGP or EVPN in that case. So that's the actual the simplification of SR. Now, let's see exactly at the building blocks of SR and how it works. Uh, we said that SR is not something new, right? Um, but technically, it is something new. Why? Because SR is based on source routing. What does that mean? Today, if you need to reach a destination, the routing is based on destination route. It's uh, destination-based routing, okay? So each and every router or each and every hop will decide how to route the traffic to the destination. With SR, that's the difference now because the source itself chooses the path, okay? So what that means is just the source uh, encodes uh, in the packet header um, a list of labels, okay? So it's an ordered list of segments. So what is a segment then? Well, a segment is an identifier for any type of instruction. Okay, so what is an instruction now? An instruction can mean a lot of things. Um, in our example, it will say, okay, go to node N using the shortest path. So node A needs to reach node N at the destination, reaching the, uh, using the shortest path, meaning based on OSPF or ISIS uh, best uh, path. Now, with SR, you can do still dynamic calculation of the path, or you can still do the uh, explicit path uh, um, traffic forwarding. Now, from data plane perspective, as I said, segment routing is new in the control plane, right? In a data plane, you still use MPLS or IPv6 for the forwarding, okay? So in the control plane now, uh, be it ISIS or OSPF, 
what they did is they just added some extensions on the protocol itself to carry on the segment routing labels or the segment IDs. Um, for the path options, as I said before, you still have the same option either dynamically or explicitly. Um, we mentioned segment IDs, right, are distributed by the IGP itself. Now, what are some of the segment IDs possible or available? Um, the IGP-based uh, segment IDs are prefix segment ID, or node seed or any cast seed, and adjacency segment ID. Now, if you look at the topology, we have three routers, right, A, B, and C. So the prefix segment ID is something that identifies the router itself. Imagine it as a loopback interface where you have an IP address that identifies that node in your network domain, right? So in that case, you will assign a prefix segment ID, meaning a label, for that loopback interface. And this label now, or that SID, is unique, or it should be unique, actually. When I say unique, it means it it is uh, globally significant. What does that mean? Now, imagine you have uh, OSPF process one running, right? In that OSPF process one, whatever router is um, participating in that process, he will know all the prefixes, he will know all the loopback interface IP addresses and everything. And on top of that, he will also know the prefix segment ID of that specific node, right? So each node will have a unique uh, value in this case, node A has 16,001, node B has 16,002, and node uh, C has 16,003. So in that case, logically, if you think, if you want to push some traffic from node A to node C, and you want to say, do not go directly, but go through node B, um, you can use prefix segment of node B. So in that case, you will say, go to 16,002, and then go to 16,003. Right? So this is a, a basic explanation of prefix segment ID. Now the um, adjacency segment ID, it's the second type of uh, segment ID in segment routing world. It basically identifies the node's physical links. Okay? So prefix segment is only one per node. Adjacency segment is per node per interface or per link. So why do we need it? Um, you will need it basically for traffic engineering, or you will need it with TILFA or fast reroute. Okay? Now, adjacency segment ID uh, is not globally significant, but it is locally significant. What does that mean? That means that node A might assign to one of the links uh, 24,001, and node B might assign the same value for its link. Okay? That's why it's locally significant. It means you can have the same values on different nodes for the adjacency segment ID. But this, this is not the same case with prefix segment IDs, where it is a unique uh, label value per node. Okay? Um, and here we have a better explanation with some clearer picture. So prefix segment ID, if you look at the um, top right picture up there, uh, you have a source as a node 1, and you have a destination node 5, okay? Um, so node 1, when it's forwarding the packet towards node 5, obviously it will go through node 2 and node 5, of course, right? Now what that means is that on node 1, uh, the label of the stack will have only one segment ID or label. So just to make it clear, a segment ID equals to a label. It's the same thing. Um, so if you think about LDP, right, how you will do the same? <clears throat> In LDP, if you forward the traffic from node 1 to node 5, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will have the same labels all the way. Why? Because node 1 might assign a label, I don't know, uh, label number 5, for node 5, node 2 might assign label 6 for node 5, which means it's not unique. In our case, node 1 will assign, uh, sorry, node 5 will assign 16,005. 
it will be distributed by ISIS. So everyone in the domain will know, okay, 16,005 belongs to node 5. Now, if I want to uh, forward traffic to node 5, I will use segment ID of 16,005, okay? And the same goes for node 3. So if he wants to forward traffic or push traffic towards node 5 as a destination, he will still use the same segment ID. Now, um, prefix segment ID offers you the possibility to, to do some sort of ECMP uh, forwarding. What is ECMP? It means uh, equal cost multipath, which means if you have two different paths to reach a destination, but those two different paths have the same cost, uh, then you can do some sort of load balancing. And that is possible uh, if you use the pref uh, prefix segment ID. Um, so the label space, uh, or what we call the sRGB in segment routing, so segment routing global block. It's a label space that starts from 16,000 to 23,999 for the prefix segment ID, or dynamically allocated um, labels. So what that means is once you enable segment routing in, on one of your router, it will, the node will automatically um, assign a default sRGB, which starts from 16,000 which means the devices will assign one of the labels starting from 16,000. Uh, the prefix segment IDs, as I said, those are stat statically assigned and um, distributed by the IGP, OSS or ISPF, uh, OSPF or ISIS. Uh, the adjacent segment ID on the other side are dynamically assigned now, right? And as I said, so if you look at the topology in node four, he has three different physical links, going to node three, node two, and node five. Now, for each of those links, he will assign a different adjacency segment ID. I said before that the adjacency segment ID has local significance. What that means is um, 24042 as an example, which goes to adjacency uh, node two, will be significant only for node four, but not for node two, okay? Even though it is advertised by ISS and OSPF, the adjacency segment ID is not really used until the point when you have TILFA enabled or you have some sort of traffic engineer running on, on your network. Now, you can use also combined SITs, meaning you can combine prefix segment ID and you can also use adjacency segment at the same time. And that is actually the traffic engineering use case here. So you might say, okay, I have a source on node one and the destination is node five, right? But I don't want to leave it up to the IGP to choose the path, I want to choose it myself, right? So you can do it in one way. So you create a label of the stack, right? So we have a packet to node five, as you can see. Now the first label, the bottommost label, is 24,045, which is the adjacency segment ID of node four to node five, right? And the top label, the one in the green, is a prefix segment ID 16,004, which means uh, node one says, okay, to go to node five, first go to node four and use ECMP in this case, because you have two different paths, the same cost, so the packets will be load balanced until node four, but from node four it will, uh, so once it reaches node four, it will pop the top label, 16,004, and it will check what is the next label in the, <coughs> in the label stack. It is 24,045, which is the adjacency segment ID of, of the link on node four going to node five. So we will know exactly now, okay, I need to push the, the traffic or the packet towards node five. So this is the, the uh, use case with combined uh, SIDs. Now, uh, topology independent LFA or TI LFA. Um, I mentioned before, TI LFA is used for traffic protection in case of node failure or a link failure. <clears throat> now, TI LFA is not also something new because we have, in traditional MPLS world, we have a fast route with LFA, right? remote LFA, direct LFA, and so on. Um, but that didn't really guarantee you 100% of protection or coverage in case of failures. <clears throat> in, 
imagine you have a, a, a ring topology in the network. In the, for example, in the Metro Ethernet network on, or in the access side, you have a, a ring. Now, TILFA will cover all sorts of failures, okay? In under 50 milliseconds. Now, what I mean with the coverage, it's like you use BFD um, for detecting a failure, but then TILFA in the background will choose a post-convergence path. Now, what is a post-convergence path? A post-convergence path means, <clears throat> for example, um, a node will calculate, okay, what happens if uh, my primary link fails? How can I reach a destination without creating any loops in the network, okay? This is called the post-convergence. So even when there is a failure happening, the node will exactly know how to reach a destination via backup path without waiting for the uh, convergence of the IGP protocol, all right? And this is a simple example in here. Um, <clears throat> so imagine you have a packet going from node A to node Z, right? Um, the link between router one and router two in here has failed. And this was used as a primary uh, link to go to node Z as a destination. So what happens is now, of course, node one will detect that, okay, I have a link failure, right? I'm using TILFA, now how can I reach a destination without waiting for the convergence to happen and then installing the new backup path and then pushing the traffic, okay? So he will calculate the post-convergence path and he will say, okay, from node one, you will assign a couple of prefixes and adjacency segment IDs. So it will create a label stack. So on top of the packet to the destination, the payload, it will say, okay, you have three labels now, all right? So the, um, the topmost label is prefixy dot of uh, router R4 in this case, okay? Now, R1 will say, okay, push the traffic towards router four. <clears throat> now, once the packet reaches router four, router four will see, okay, what is the next label in the label stack? It will see, okay, this is an adjacency segment ID of my link going towards router three. Now, why do we use adjacency segment ID in this case? We can say, okay, why don't you use the prefix segment ID? Well, because router four will check, okay, to reach router three, I have a metric of 1,000, so a cost of 1,000. So what it means is for him, because you can see the default metric or the default cost on all the links is 10. Now, for router four to reach router three with a prefix segment ID, he will not go directly because he has a cost of 1,000, but he will go all the way up to router one. Now, in order to enforce router four to go to router three through the directly connected link, you will have to use the adjacency segment ID, okay? Because the adjacency segment ID, as we said, is per node per link. That's why you say router four, use that directly connected link to router three and push the traffic towards router three, okay? Now, once the packet arrives at router three, it will see, okay, what is the next label in the stack? Or the, what is the next SID? It will see, okay, the next SID is the prefix SID of uh, node Z, which is a destination. Now, router three, of course, he will calculate what is the best path to reach uh, router Z. In that case, if the cost is 10 on all the links apart from the link between R4 and R3, he will just forward it towards node uh, two as a next stop and then it will reach the destination. So this is a very good example on <clears throat> how TILFA can cover each and every scenarios in case of a link or node failure. In our example, this is a, a link failure, but uh, it's more or less the same for the node failure. Uh, segment drafting, uh, traffic engineering. So um, the traditional MPLS RSVPTE, right? You have the head end, you have the tail end, you have the midpoints. You create the tunnels, right? So the tunnel had to be signaled all the way which means yeah, if you have the tunnel, all the routers between the head end and the tail end needed to be signaled and had to keep a state of the tunnel, right? Now that changes with SRTE. 
uh, because there is no state at all at the midpoint routers. The state is being kept only at the head end, okay? Now, we mentioned prefix seed and adjacency seeds. In SRTE, there's a binding seed. So a binding seed is just an identifier of the SRTE tunnel, but we don't call it SRTE tunnel, we call it an SR policy. And that's basically based on the standards and the RFCs, okay? Because it has also a, um, a different way of working. It's not the same as a tunnel. So binding seed identifies an SR policy. In our example, uh, the source is node one. The destination is, for example, node three on the right side. Uh, you say, okay, if a packet comes with a binding seed, so the top level is a binding seed of 24008, it ident identifies an SR policy, and I know how to treat that uh, packet uh, based on the behavior, based on the binding seed, actually. And I know how the, the routers on the way know how to behave in case of, uh, in, in that case. So SRPC, what is an SRPC? Is SRPC is just a controller that um, basically does the uh, calculation of the path. So instead of the head end to do it, you can use a controller on top and do all the calculations, right? Uh, SRPC uses the PSEP protocol, which is not something new. So what happens is, uh, if a PCC, in that case, a head end, calculates or needs to reach a destination, he will ask the uh, SRPC, okay, can you please calculate for me a path how to reach a destination? And the SRPC will push down that instruction with the PSAP protocol. Okay, it will say, okay, to reach a destination, please use uh, those uh, sort of uh, labels. And the SRPC keeps the LSP database and the traffic engineering database. LSP database means uh, ISS or uh, OSPF uh, databases. Now, how does uh, SRPC know all the, um, let's say, OSPF or ISIS database, it knows it basically with the um, BGP LS, right? So one of the routers in your domain has to speak with BGP link state protocol with the controller so that the controller is being fed with the, all the informations of the uh, uh, ISIS or OSPF database, which means he has the visibility of all the different domains. So some of the use cases with uh, SR, um, I've put some of them, such as uh, Flex Algo, which is something new, SD1 over segment routing, uh, disjointness, and uh, inter AS. So, what is Flex Algo? Obviously, whoever he is from the service provider world, you know that <coughs> usually you have a dual plane, uh, dual plane topologies in your network, right? For uh, uh, primary and backup purposes, or <coughs> even for active active uh, forwarding. Now, Flex Algo gives you that opportunity. Meaning that, for example, uh, you have the nodes uh, on the upper side, which are in the green, and the nodes in the red, right? So dual plane. So you can say, okay, all the nodes in, in, in the green will have a flex algo of 128. 128 is just a value that you assign to those devices with a prefix seed on top of that. And then the devices on the red side, the downside, and the bottom will have a flex algo of 129. Now, whenever you push traffic from zero to nine, from source to the destination, in, instead of giving all the prefix segment IDs, you say, okay, just follow flex algo 128, right? Because everyone in the, in the, in the network knows what flex algo 20, 128 means. They know how to behave with that, traffic, uh, with that packet. This is an example where you use Flex Algo 0, which is a default one, <coughs> meaning you use ECMP. Uh, this is uh, the example with Flex Algo 128, right? You have a, a top level with 16,809, which identifies the Flex Algo 128, and all the devices on the way in the path, they know how to treat that packet. And the same happens for, for uh, Flex Algo 129. So all the packets, uh, uh, all the nodes in the path, they know how to treat the packet based on the, on the value numbers that they received. Now the other use case with the SD1 over uh, segment routing, basically what it means is you can have a SD1 device on the edge assigning a DSCP value for, for example, voice application so that the service provider will know how to treat that voice uh, packet based on the DSCP. So you assign the SD1, you say, okay, the outer tag is DSCP, for example, 46, 
and the PE device and the service providers, I will say, okay, I received a this, uh, packet with DCP, DCP value 46, so I know that this is a voice application traffic, and I will use, a, let's say, the low delay path. The disjoint with uh, SRPCE, this is another example um, where you can use different PE nodes or different ingress PEs to use different paths on the way, okay? So you might say, okay, customer A will go through path one and customer B will go through path B so they will not uh, boom into each other, okay? And the last use case is the inter-AS with SRPC and BGB pairing seat. So you have AS1 and you have AS6 on the right side. Now how do you make them talk to each other? Before you had to use BGP LU, with SR you use the BGP peering seed now. It's the same use case as BGP LU. So you assign to uh, node two towards node four, a BGP peering seed of, in our case, uh, 30,024. And <clears throat> what happens is you have an end-to-end -end path from uh, source is on AS1 and destination is AS6. Uh, you create the label stack. You say, okay, 16,002 is the prefix seed of node two, which is my egress device on AS1. And now to reach that another AS, you use the BGP peering seed of uh, 300,000 of 24. And then once the packet reaches node four on AS6, then he will use the next label in the stack, which is 18,006, the prefix seed of node six. So to conclude it, um, <clears throat> it has a strong customer adoption. So segment routing has been implemented with many, many customers in Germany, in Europe, and around the world. Um, it has also a, actually uh, an RFC 8402, which is an ITF standard. And the best part is that it has a multi-vendor consensus. So it's not only Cisco or any other vendor, but it's most of the vendors have already implemented it. And so I would like to thank you all of this. Any questions there?